Halo, 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 halo. Ya udah begitu. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear students. Uh, I'm particularly happy that we are in a reasonable amount for the earliest Tredevekinak ever. We never had a lecture so early, and uh, I would never accept it if this would not be for a very special guest. She's Beate Frick, and so I'm particularly happy to introduce Beate here. Beate is uh, right now professor at the University of Bern, but uh, she has a very how to say, nice past. She's been in Berkeley as professor as well, but she worked also for the Max Planck Institute for Kunstgeschichte in Florence and Rome. No. no. <laughs> how is it possible then? You were a borsista. No. <laughs> I know you, I understand. No, the mistake is Officially because... Officially, I was never married. Officially, but... I wanted to do it. No, so she was not officially, but her supervisor was the director of the Max Planck Institute. That, that make me confusing. And um, Beate is a, a very Renaissance uh, art historian because she's not the, the kind of art historian working all the life or f on one transept of one church on the right somewhere. But she likes basically everything in pre-modern and also not pre-modern cultures. And um, the, the most important the book published, you should surely know, is uh, the book on s on images, on the bird, on the three-dimensional images on the Lat in the Latin West, which is, however, linked to one very dear person for us, which is Saint-Foy of Kong. So Beate wrote this very influential book, which has been published first in German and then in English in 2015, and the German in 2007, if I'm not wrong. But um, right now, Beate had opened her horizon to a very global world, in all sense of the term. She's directing a big project on global horizons in Bern, and uh, she collaborated with one other of our friends, Barry Flood, in a book which is a kind of crossing the border, not only between fields and specializations, but also between scholars who are co-writing together, so something which we appreciate a lot. So. Um, I, I think I've said the main points, apart of the fact that Beate is also a very lovely person. So this is a huge privilege having her here. And I will just let you speak, finishing my introduction. And um, yes, the only point is that you also you should kind of speak. Okay, the first person falling asleep in the back should actually alert me and say if I'm not talking loud enough. Is it good, fun, good like that? You can hear me well? Yeah, I have a theory that the pandemic is kind of has affected us not only our not only our daily life as you have all experienced, but also our creativity. And the main important part that was missing is that we we are bored in lectures, and that we become creative in the moment when we actually listen to someone and then are bored and then our mind wanders. So. Either you're listening to me and you're agreeing with what I'm saying, or I hope you get some really interesting theories which you then share with me afterwards, which I always take as a reward too. So I'm very happy to present you a new object I have recently discovered through a student of mine who went on a hike in Switzerland. And he, he found one of these weird leaflets you find in those churches. And he was knowing that I was working on the four element theories and then he said, there is a cross and that has these four elements on it. And that was the origin. So I have to say thank you to Gregor von Kersten von Krosig, who actually kind of pointed out that cross to me. And Finn Barberi Flat and Gregor were actually present when we were allowed to see the cross, which is usually locked up and you never are allowed to see it at all. It's only used for processions. And so if, even if you visit the monastery, you don't see it. And that's why I think is there is so little scholarship on it. And it has a fantastic and complex project uh, uh, program. And I want to <coughs> embed it into a system of thought at the time when it was actually done. And I think we can get some really interesting clues from reading, from doing a close reading from this course. OK, so I will start right away. This is kind of the outline of what I plan to do with you so that you're getting a little bit oriented. And, and you will see I won't focus only on the four element theory, but and also on this, there, there, there are a certain type of tract involving the 12 stones, which some of you might know. Then I will speak about the diagrams in the four element 
theories describing um, the four elements, and then I will show how um, the four elements were part of the creation, and then I have a radical idea at the end, which I would love to discuss with all of you. So that's the plan for now. Let's start with the four elements. Locked up, high up in Swiss mountains in the monastery of Engelberg, we discover the fruits of medieval scholarly knowledge embedded into a reliquary cross, wherein such knowledge formed a close union with the spirituality incited by its liturgical use. The cross was, was and still is carried around in procession, and it's damaged because of that. So you have this, the, the one weirdly push thing, uh, actually the science of the use. On the front, it shows a superbly crafted gilded body of Christ at the cross, with five red jewels marking his wounds, as if nails have already decayed and the visual evidence of his blood petrified into a gemstone illuminates his suffering and sparkles it away at the same time may be modeled after the true cross by Abbot Suger in Paris, the rubies are placed at the position of the five wounds. A small particle of the wooden cross contents its, um, cross content, contents its carried by two angels and is made visible by a cross-shaped opening covered with glass just above the gem encrusted crown on Christ's head. He surrounded by the four evangelists placed at the ends of the cross arms. Their symbols reach from another almost heavenly sphere as if they whisper the words of divine truth into the evangelist ears like the dove in representation of Gregory the Great. And I walk you now through the front side of the cross. So here you have John. I think this is the bow. Mark the lion, and here we are. Um, I'm not going into the discussion where the cross was made, so the extant scholarship act actually argues for a workshop in Germany, which I think doesn't make any sense because we don't have really convincing comparable um, objects. But I think the analogies to manuscripts, which I just show you here um, as a comparison, which were made in Swiss scriptories, are stronger evidence than the suggestion to locate the origin of the cross in, in a German workshop. And I don't want to bore you with the stylistic comparisons because that's what's basically, there's no other link to a German workshop, just the comparison that have been done on, styli stylistic, um, on a stylistic basis and that's rather unconvincing from a modern perspective or from a current perspective. All four evangelists are seated at a desk and are deeply emerged into writing down what they have witnessed with their eyes, while our eyes are caught by an unusual scene below Christ's feet. Eyesight is again at the core. The brazen serpent and the healing power of seeing and believing overcomes, is overcoming the venomous bites of the devilish creatures. The snakes are attacking the members of the people of Israel standing next to Moses with the brazen snake. The fight, um, the fight taking place above depicts an extremely rare scene of a lion attacking the basilisk. So if you have never seen that, don't, no wonder I didn't either. I didn't also before. Here it is further emphasized the theme of overcoming sin and all evil. The combination of the chosen motives walks a fine line between medical and spiritual <coughs> healing and prepares the beholder for the cross even more surprising reverse. Now we go to the other side. Not gilded and without any precious stones at all, the view of the back is presented with a monochromatic silver surface. Mary is seated on a throne, holding the child on her left leg, tightly with her left hand. Both child and mother have risen their right arms up into the air. Christ is blessing, Mary is presenting a lily, two angels shield the two protagonists with their wings. The Holy Spirit, as dove with a cruciform halo, unfolds his invisible power from above, 
accompanied on the cross's inner arms with half figures showing Peter on the left with the key and St. Theodore on the right with the crozier, the, the latter of whom was bishop at the Valais at the time when, of the Tibian revolt. Below Mary, we encounter further standing saints, Nicholas st styled as a bishop, and St. Leonard as abbot, so typical Swiss saints. Um, below him, a kneeling abbot, Henry, is identified through the inscription around his portrait, Memento Medeus Heinrichus Peccator. Henry of Wattenbach was abbot in Engelberg from 1197 to 1223. He was the fourth abbot of the monastery at all. And that's the likely time when this cross was made because we don't have other matching, other Henrys that fit exactly to the way how the cross is done. The oldest extant chronicle reports that in 1223, Henry restored the monastery after a fire three, three years prior and ensured the care of a large cross containing relics and 97 relics were actually found in the 19th century in this cross. So there's a substantial amount of relics. The most unusual and very intriguing part of the silver side of the cross, however, is not the long genealogical display of abbots claiming a visual tradition rooted in Peter and in local saints, but the representations of the four elements. I think that's the most exciting part. <laughs> Fire writes on a line on, at the top above the dove of the Holy Spirit. This corresponds to Mark and his line at the front side. And then I will talk about the correspondence of evangelists and the four elements a little bit longer later, because I think that there's really interesting, meaningful, meaningful connections. Um, water. No, oh, that's air. Sorry. So. Mm -hmm. Fire writes on the top, above the dove of the Holy Spirit, this corresponds to, and his line on the front side. Air on the right, with rings, echoes John's eagle on the cross's other side. Water is on the left with a fish, and earth is with a ball at the bottom. The four elements are usually depicted in illuminated manuscripts with tracts on the nature of things from Isidore of Seville or Rabanus Maurus, to which we will turn in a few minutes. Furthermore, we encounter them in illuminations in Genesis since the 11th century, and more frequently in manuscripts containing commentaries on Genesis dating to the 12th century. Their pairing with the symbols of the evangelist, however, is rare, and it is a question if the two medallions have changed, so because the water and some of the, the bowl isn't matching the bowl, so the question is either they have changed their position or there is a deeper meaning to their alignment. So their pairing with the symbols of the evangelist, however, is rare, and the question if two medallions have changed their original location is evident if we bring another comparison into the discussion. The ivory cover of the Evangelium Longum, preserved at St. Gaul, carved by Tuotilo in 894 for Codices 53, a manuscript written and illuminated by Master Sintram at the same time. On the ivory, John's eagle is paired with fire, Matthew's angel with air, Luke's bowl with earth, and Mark's lion with water. So the question is, why is, is that different? In our cross. So, however, be it as it may, or putting aside for now the question of the original location of the medallions, the representation of the four elements on the Engelberg cross is a unique choice for a reliquary cross and as a liturgical object. At the front side, a crook's schemata, and on the reverse, a scholarly informed program. However, the strong opposition of religion and science is in fact a modern one. And I want to show in the second part of this paper that the choice was informed by a learned tradition of thinking systematically through about worlds we consider today as disconnected, in fact, as in fact together. 
key to understanding the close connections is a mode of systematically thinking in quaternities. And that's my key point, that something we have kind of forgotten, that there was this medieval fashion that you think in this four, four thing systems like in this thinking in quaternitas is a very convincing mode of like understanding and comprehending also the world because if you bring, if you think on different axes in these four systematic ways, somehow a lot of uh, the, the world, the layers of the world you can perceive and the layers of the world you can't see come together magically in these thinking in quaternitas. But I will unfold that a little bit later. Um, this is relating to the creation of the cosmos, caring for human health, experiencing time and space. And, and since you all are working with Ivan Folletti, I'm carrying, I think in English you say, calls to shark to, 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 to a castle, Newcastle, I think. Yeah. Um, we in German say carrying alls to Athens. So whatever you want to do, I'm sure you have a Czech variant of that. I am not, um, I don't, I'm not familiar with. I'm showing here, a, here a diagram from a Carolingian manuscript around 800, unpacking the relationship between cosmos, mundus, world, so mundus for world, annus and homo. So these are, this is an example of one of such fraternity. Like these worlds have to be thought together. But before we return to a more detailed discussion of the four elements, I would like to show further the degree to which the Engelbergs cross front and back are intimate, intimately related to each other. And I come to the parts with the 12 stones. The 12th century is the century providing us with short text discussing the properties and origin of 12 stones, often called the 12 stones tract. If you have never heard of that kind of genre of text, no wonder I didn't before I started that research either. Um, it's also in Latin, it's often called the du duo de duo de kim gemis. These texts are compilation of earlier texts, such as the biblical description of Ezekiel's vision of the heavenly Jeru Jerusalem, combining it with information about stones from Pliny, Isidore, Rabanus, Marbot of Rennes, and others. So it's basically a syn syn synthesis of what we know about stones. So each, each stone kind of gets a little bit what is usually associated with that particular stone. These short texts are particularly interesting for us and haven't really been used by any art historian systematically so far. And I think it's really um, a good occasion that we should do that and look at them a little bit closer. Um, because it shows that the knowledge about the qualities and properties attributed to stones did not only travel along the reception from one author to the other, but was an active process of compilation and might have inspired Goldsmith choosing stones for liturgical ob objects as well as informed their audience about their meaning. Christel Meyer has shown how allegories could work in both ways. The stones on the cross at Engelberg, unfortunately, are mostly modern, in modern settings and are made with modern cuts. So almost no stone you actually see is actually original. The, hole, the holes below the frames, framing panels with filigree on the front side show that the present ornamentation is not original at all. The 17th century description in the annals of Abbot Benedict Keller mentions a carbuncle stone sending out light in the dark so one could read without candles. Just like you sit next to the cross and if the light is, is going off, you could actually still read. In 1908, when the cross was repaired again, this is the carbuncle. Um, in 1908, when the cross was repaired <coughs> again, restor restorators were removing the replacements dating to the seventh century when Ab Abbot Gregor Fleischlin had replaced some lost pearls of the more of 100 pearls and replaced gems through glass with glass stones. Therefore, we can only speculate what kind of stones have once decorated the cross. We can be sure though that pearls and gemstones were part of the original composition. And one could, presu could presume that the use of four different type of stones, and that's something we still see in the modern glass cuts, um, that these four types of stones surrounding the four evangelists, let me see, I should have a picture here. No, not yet. Here, you see it's always four different kinds of 
stones. Um, surrounding the four evangelists might also go back to an original design. As Theo Jülich has once shown, one can use the color and divergences from color pattern as a mode to reconstruct the original ornamentation of such crooks de Marta. It seems no coincidence to me that the Burger Bibliothek Bern alone has six different manuscripts with the so-called 12 stone tracts that have been preserved from the 12th century. I cannot go into detail about what these texts say about each different type of stone. Then you would actually really doze off. No? Um, but what matters to my argument here is that these discussions of stones, the Latin West digest mostly Greek and Arabic theories about attributed qualities to the four elements. Dry, humid, hot, and cold. So these are, the, this are the ideas that are repeatedly mentioned in these texts and their impact about the generation of stones, so how were they actually created, and organisms. They discuss the origin of gemstones in the four elements and the degree to which such elemental natures may be made visible or palpable through viewing and examining the stones and the gemstones originating in the four elements. So the four elements play a key role in this text genre. Albert Magnus, for example, refers to Avicenna's De Congelazione when he ponders why the four elements constituting everything since the time of creation cannot be disintegrated again, and only in rare occasions like an earthquake. That would be such a moment where kind of something that has turned into a specific zone, like a granite, then suddenly becomes one of the four elements again. So this is the idea that to going back to this Urstoff, this kind of original material from which everything was created, is almost impossible, and that the stones are like the first step um, out of which things are created. Um, he emphasizes, so still I'm Albert Magnus, that the disintegration, I quote here, this depends on the potency of the active qualities, heat and cold, and the state of the passive qualities, moist and dry. Even more important, no, oh, this is the carbuncle stuff to which I'm coming now. Even more important for our course in book two, he tracked one, he points out the relationship between stones and elements. And that's what I've put here on the slide. I quote, for in the upper spheres, there are four colors, which are also the colors most frequently found in precious stones. One of these is the color of the starless sphere. So he's thinking systematically in a cosmo, cosmo, cosmological dimension immediately, which is called sapphire by everyone. The second color is that of most stars, which is called bright, shining white. The third is called fury and flashing. This is the sun and Mars and certain other stars. And this is preeminently the color of the carbuncle. And after this, of, of granites. And therefore, they say that the carbuncle is the nobles having the powers of all other heavenly power. And this is his universal power that gives brightness and power to all heavenly things. So you see how many different layers are already put together in that kind of text. The fourth color is a dark cloudiness found in certain stars, as well as in some of some of the mansions of the moon, so you have to go to the astronomy thinking. And this is found in stones containing dark clouds, such as chalcedony, amethyst, and sometimes in smaragd and others. So things we today consider as like inclusions and strange stuff is kind of, for him, the most interesting because you have kind of the spheres of the invisible invisibility where our gaze can't get through, and that means there's something divine. Such interest in stone was also present in Engelberg, where half, where half of Marbot of Wren's stone tract, De la Pilibus, one of the most widely circulated of its kind, was copied in Codex 44. Here, I have, that's a picture of that particular page. Um, and one of, and on this part, this is one of the three pages where you find that fact. So, like, Albert the Great, Marwood also emphasizes the healing power in the, in the prologue. And that's what I find interesting, that it's not just about cosmology and the world, but also the effect you could create with the cross. 
So I quote again, you can read it here. Hence may the healing art new aid derive, thought taught by their virtue plagues a way to drive. For sages tell by creative he heaven, distinctive potency to gems is given. And bore experience surely doth attest the native virtue by each stone possessed. Though in the herb a potent virtue lurks, greatest of all which in jewel works. So you see kind of that carrying around the cross could actually have had healing powers. So what I would like you to take away from this detour to text read by the members of the monastery at Engelberg is that the gems were not just an ornament to the cross, but an integrative and essential elements to the virtues of the cross process possessed through the relics, through the stones and the perception of the quaternity the quaternities. So that kind of the power bestowed to the object and your ability to read and understand that power that needs to come together to actually make the cross work. Um, the, represent, the representation of the four elements on the reverse and the incarnate and the the four elements incarnated in the gemstones on the front was a juxtaposition highlighting the relationship between cosmos world, anus, and homos, homo. The time of the creation of the Engelberg cross around 1200 is exactly the time when the Platonic and the Aristotelian ideas about the cosmos and its creation from the four elements are discussed in the Latin West. Just a short detour to another project of mine. Before, like in the, before the 11th century, we mostly have the, the ideas kind of, we, we stick to the Bible. And when all the new knowledge through Arabic translations and commentaries poured into the Latin West, then they had to get the biblical account about the creation together with the philosophical ideas about the creation. And part of that system, like the, the bringing that together, was introducing the four elements, which were not mentioned in the Bible, of course. But then it's interesting that you see how, what do they do with the four elements. So. Um, while through the commentary of Calcidius on the Timaeus, which was only, only the first half was known to the Latin West um, in the first millennium, a reflection on the qualities attributed to each of the four elements dominated, visualized in the famous diagram of the lower church of Ananyi, which you probably um, all have in your mental um, uh, phototech. <laughs> Um, the scholars discuss these ideas in the context of their reception of Aristotelian ideas. I come to the figure, so the diagrams. So figure is not only to imagine, but also to kind of represent and, and, and compose a diagram. A figure in a manuscript is essential for two actions, understanding the text and believing the divine truth mediated through reading the text and the image together. So you need to see the diagram to actually understand what you really read. Based on the spiritual and intellectual reading and understanding taken together, one com can compare, compare these figure to liturgical objects, trigger spiritual, visual, and sensual experiences of invisible truths. Medi mediated, for example, through the relic, and at the same time provide knowledge about the past, for example, the genealogy, of the donor to Peter on the front of the Engelberg cross. Also, the visible gemstones on the cross provide a learned viewer with the opportunity to apply his or her knowledge about the invisible properties of stones. So what do these figure in this manuscript exactly do? In order to consider the stone's capacity for reflecting the elements and the quaternities, it is first important to sketch out in writing at the time how scholars conceptualized what it meant to represent. The most widely read encyclopedic tract was Isidore of Sevilla's De Natura Rerum, a compendium on the nature of things. Especially in the 9th century, this text can be found in several manuscripts dating to the late 9th and 10th century, and a second rise can be observed for the 12th century. Isidore calls the diagrams accompanying his text figure. So that's the, the word he's actually using. They form an essential part of his text. He refers to them regularly, as does a bit before him Cassiodor, 
or the author of a text entitled, which is anonymous, we don't know it, but it's a super important text. It's called Schemata Dioneas Qua Ad Rhetoris Pertinent. It's a super exciting text, which I really want to explore further about how you invent diagrams. Like how, how do you come up with an idea, a convincing idea? So it's a, basically a design, an idea about early medieval design. It sits there, we have the text, and no one has ever really made the step, and I think there, there's really a big potential what we can figure out from there. Um, the latter of which interrogates directly the notion of figures of thought. So making and composing and perceiving such a figure is not only kind of to illuminate something or to illustrate something, but also to think it and, and really is a thought figure. <coughs> what Benjamin later then has called a denk bild. And I'm sure you have an even better term in Czech. I provide here an example from a manuscript from Salzburg, which has been discussed in detail by, in detail by Bruno Reudenbach. The figura consists of two circles into which, and you have stared at it, but probably you haven't really understood it, so I walk you also through that image a little bit. Um, because it took me also some time to get it figured out. The figura consists of two circles into which six fields are inscribed. These fields are divided from colored lanes, which are carefully depicted laying over or passing under a lane, and that matters whether they are above or below, like creating like a reef-like pattern. The choice of color adds to the differentiation given through the inscriptions. The diagram is an essential part of the second part of chapter 11 of um, De Natura Rerum, describing the parts of the world. Isidor Samerweis's Empedocles, so a classic um, philosopher, teaching of the four elements. Terra, aqua, air, and ignis are the substances from which the world is created, and four qualities, calidus for warm, frigidus, cold, secus, dry, and humidus, humid, are attributed to these elements. Each element is defined through two of these qualities. Isidore is adding here Aristotelian ideas. So the Empedocles comes, does the thing with the qualities, and Aristotle kind of comes with the four elements, and he merges the two of them. Um, each element is def um, Isidore is adding here Aristotelian ideas about the four elements, combining Empedocles' ideas about the creation of the cosmos with the four essential qualities he derives from ancient medicine. However, the direct transmission of Aristotle's idea about the four elements was not through Isidore, but through Ambrose of Milan, to whom Isidore explicitly refers as St. Ambrose. And I will explain that a little bit in detail. After including Platonic aspects, so you see how they try to get everything together. So they know these four elements and they try to systemize them and to bring them into pictures. And that's quite an achievement, I must say, because it's less, less clear. And, and I try to give you a, a distilled clarity version of it. But if you read it, it actually, you, you have to read it five, five times. So after including platonic aspects of the four element, Isidore returns to Aristotle and introduces another diagram. And I show you one, this a type of that. You would recognize them immediately. They are all looking the same. But this is the diagram that follows then on the other one, in which, and T refers to that as figura solida, which is already a strange term. Two squares are to be seen as a cube. Plato had described the Earth as a cube. That's what he wants to represent here. The two circles can be interpreted as sun and moon. The fi figure carrying the construct could be read at, as an atlas. This, is very this very confusing diagram can only be understood if we go a little bit back in time and consider what, Isi what Isidore has seen and based his design upon. So I guide you back. So now we are at a Cassidore manuscript of the same problem and topic. And you see how he comes from there to his strange two cube thing. He created his figura solida on the basis of a diagram, part of an older text by Cassiodo. And that's something Bruno Reudenbach strangely hasn't figured out, but it's, it's very evident. Um, 
Uh, in Cassiodor's Institutiones, that's the title we usually use for this text, here in a manuscript preserved in a 9th century manuscript from the Reichenau, the illuminator has not tried to illuminate the embedded ideas about the four elements as perspectival body, as we have seen in the Isidor manuscript, but kind of um, as a list of qualities. Dry, cold, most, and hot, aligning the two with, with each other of four elements. Each element is given a different um, geometrical scape. And that is then re-embedded then into the diagram on the left. The importance of the addition of the, of the additional figura solida, however, points back to the major difference to modern thought, the spiritual experience of the visible world and knowledge derived from observations of real thing connected to invisible divine truths. Another type of relating divine truth written down here on this page of the manuscript with Rabanus Maurus Liber de, Lib de Laudibus Sanctis, Sancti Crucis, which you probably have all seen one version of it, uh, it's yeah, probably there. <coughs> um, and we always see this picture, but we don't really get what, what is embedded in these weird um, figures. So he's so-called, in German, called Figurengedichte, so figure poems, poemas in figuras, a poem encompassing 35 to 41 letters in line. What you see here is figura seven, describing the four elements, the four seasons, and the four cardinal directions. You see again the thinking in fraternities. While theological commentaries, and here is another version where you see kind of those figures together on one page, and you see how kind of the, these sequences are actually helping to unfold the series of... Um, yeah. While theological commentaries on Genesis in the West included the um, four elements early on, let me see, yeah, the four elements early on based on Basil's hexamerum in the West, it is particularly the venerable Bede who in his later works presumed that prime matter consisting of all four elements was created before the first day. Alcuin of York, who died 804, considers the four elements to be hidden in this materia informis, providing the material that is given the shape in the six days of the creation. So that is the, how they merged the four elements into the biblical story of the creation. As Johannes Zalten has shown, the number of commentaries on Genesis peaked in the 12th century, combining the various traditions. I am showing you here the famous illumination from a manuscript with Honorius Augustudonensis Clavis Physica, representing ideas regarding the four elements that derive from or can be traced back to Bede's ideas that heaven and earth were created together with the four elements, but that it was only after that that order was established. Okay, now I have, that's the maximum we had to digest. Now it's getting easier. Depicting the four elements as part of creation. Now you see where I'm coming. Now come the illumination of the Genesis, which is an overdue passion of mine. <laughs> and I'll show you just a little part of it. How does one now merge the biblical account and the idea of the creation of the cosmos out of the four elements in illuminations of the story of Genesis? Again, theology and natural philosophy are only, from a modern perspective, two different disciplines. This is particularly evident in two Bibles from 11th century Spain, the Roda and the Ripoll Bibles, who provide us, which provide us with another important part of the story. Both codices were illuminated in the Benedictine Abbey of Santa Maria de Ripoll at Girona under the Abbot Oliva. Here, and you see a detail. From whom we have a very nice con commentary which we can exploit. And the person who has discovered that first is Manuel Castineras Gonzalez, who has pers persuasively suggested that the illuminators tried to establish the first day of the creation by means of a conceptualized, I quote him, representation of the passage from chaos to cosmos, end of quote. Castineras also shows that in departing from the depiction of the abyss, which you see here on the left, as a mask figure, like the Roman personification of Okeanos, the illumination displays roots in Hesiod's Theogony. 
and he draws convincing connections to Platonic ex exegetical readings of the creation's first day, such as Williams of Kong's Philosophia Mundi. And no worries, I don't get you there into the text. I just want to mention that he has figured out the, the text that the Abbot was actually reading for coming up with these really fantastic illuminations. So in these writings, the primordial chaos is defined as a kind of confusing, um, as a kind of confusion of the four elements. Furthermore, Casineras emphasizes the importance of Abbot Oliva's commentary on Timaeus, where Oliva explains the meaning of the Latin term silver, meaning wood, as well as chaos, yet to be shaped. So matter, yet to be shaped. That all is embedded into this term silver. Calcidus, in his commentary, took a similar approach for explaining the Krieg, Hüle, Chaos. The, in, the inscription at the top of the full page mini miniature in the Ripoll Bible reads, and that's what you can read here on the upper left, Abyssus retinens in se cuncta creata, the abyss holding back in itself what was created. The use of the present participle past possible of retinence holding back and the past participle creata reveals, Castineros observes, that the four elements were already created and are being retained in the abyss. According to Calcidius, who established the medieval understanding of the Platonic approach to creation and matter, the relationship between matter, craftsman, creation, and God is the following. Matter then being what that which receives all incidental attributes in itself is called void, in the sense that it appears incapable of ever being filled, and it's called nothing, because it is devoid of all things. By Simachus, however, it is called inert and disordered and chaotic, in the sense that, it, it is, that of itself it is incapable of doing anything, and is considered disordered, that it has the aptitude for receiving order from God, who in building the world adorns it and orders it. The phrase, in a state of dumb admiration, and these texts are really funny if you read them closely, in a state of dumb admiration, on the other hand, identifies a certain power of likeness to soul, since it was struck, by, it was struck dumb by the majesty of its craftsman and maker. But if a previously formless corporeal matter, which all scriptures calls earth, was made by God, then I suppose there is no need for despair concerning there having been an intellectual matter of a corporeal kind as well, which was given the name heaven. And the view that it was made and made in such a way that there exists matter which did not exist, they defend as follows. Matter is bestowed ready-made upon mortal craftsmen, by other craftsmen, and upon the latter by nature, upon nature by God, and by, upon God by no one. So he tries to figure out where does actually creativity come from in the end. Okay, that was an important part. Thus, we have, thus far we have considered the two illumination as illuminating the same aspects of creation, but there are significant differences. But the few yet distinct differences between them are equally important. In both the Roda Bible and the Ripoll Bible, the abyss is depicted in four colors, referring to the four elements and four connected qualities. The fish are a sign of the element water, the birds for the element air. In the Ripoll Bible, however, we first see the primordial abyss and beside it, a circle divided in four spheres. And because we have already seen the Isidore diagram, you can now easily recognize what it actually should represent. Um, we, in a circle divided in four spheres, the Earth as a small ball at the center, surrounded by a wider sphere of water and two outer spheres, fire and air. Next to this cosmos that is now in order, we see two human personification of night and day, now separated. So this is how they get the biblical account um, into the creation story together with the four elements. The two lower registers, no. here you have to read. No. The two lower registers tell the story of Genesis, I will show you the whole page, according to the second account, beginning with the creation of Adam and Eve, the fall, the punishment, and the expulsion from paradise. What we find in the Ripoll Bible 
is thus a clear sequence of events from cosmos. Right, see if I, well, I don't have it. Yeah, I, I show it to you later. Um, what we find in the Ripoll Bible is thus a clear sequence of events from a cosmos in disorder to, that skips from the first day directly to the sixth with the creation of man. The deciphered difference in the Roda Bible, which we see here, is that the cosmos is now clearly divided into four different elements depicted between night on the left and Luna and Terra and day on the, uh, standing on the air on the right with soul. So you see kind of that separation is a profound difference to um, the Ripoll Bible. In the lower left corner, we find wat a wat the watery abyss with animals living in the sea. Fire is now zigzagging a little hill with stronger reddish tones. In this Bible, the alignment of elements and properties lays even stronger emphasis on the inherent forces embedded by the divine creator into matter. The abyss is not only the first stage in which all elements are in disorder. Here, it has become aligned with water as one of the four different representations of the four elements from which, according to the Platonic ideas, the cosmos was created. This shift eliminates the temporal sequence um, prison, which we have seen in the Ripoll Bible, where Abus is placed in the upper left corner and its titleless, titleless is the first and only text on the page. I have no time to delve deeper into Oliver de Ripoll's reception of diagrams, which we just had discussed. I'm just showing you illuminations to his commentary on Calcidius, which you will all recognize easily now. So you again clearly can now see, okay, this is his thinking through the four elements with diagrams of Isidore in his mind. And here you discover Cassiodor again. So you see kind of that in such a comment, all the former diagram tradition are also embedded. And here you, can, you see again the figura solida. Mm -hmm. So you see that kind of all the figures go into such a 11th century commentary that sums up like the different tradition. Okay. A strong emphasis on God's ordering power is embedded into a unique illumination of the cosmic creation from the four elements in the frontispiece to a French Genesis commentary dating to the 12th century, which is now preserved in Vendôme. The commenta commentary's author has not yet been identified and the text has not been edited. So that's still work to be done. The diversity of creative powers in each element and color has a particular intriguing pictorial composition. The three angels, the Holy Spirit, and the divine creator enact the eruptive pictorial Big Bang, a true creation ex nihilo, aligning and combining the four elements symbolized by the colors blue, red, green, and faded yellow. With his hand, the creator seems to grasp into the circle at the center from which the, it's, the different streams are pouring out as if setting the planet in motion. Earth at the bottom of the page is fertile, putting forth buds and leaves. A green stream of water is pouring out of the cosmos while fish swim against the current back to the center of the page. Inside the inner sphere, we see four heads of blue water creatures with strange variety of mouths in the shape of the fish's soft lips and the sharp beaks of a bird. The touch of God's fingers seemed to insert a series of reddish stars within a stream of wavy, wavy lines, different colors expanding to the white. This extraordinary depiction does not seem to have any, had, had any reception at all um, in its time, yet its originality makes it stand out as a 12th century artwork, produced at a threshold moment when Aristotelian ideas about prime matter and the prime mover altered the way theologians thought about creation and thus the fabric of the created world. In this manner, the Vendôme illumination marks an insertion of new ideas into the older effort to combine a Chalcedius transmitted Platonism with the Genesis narrative. I come to my next point, which is a little bit more experimental, and we will see if you agree or maybe disagree. The so-called blower 
today in Vienna is like the Engelberg cross, an object that was probably used liturgically and at the same time beholders watching it operating could gain insights about the four elements interacting. I would suggest it was an object that could elucidate the, bef the aforementioned re relationship between cosmos, mundus, annus, and homo, though in this case it was slightly different. Although the name for this figure, blower, gives particular emphasis to air, the medieval descriptions emphasize all four elements when describing its use. As Albertus Magnus puts it, again in a passage related to earthquakes, whose power to redivide four elements usually joined in acts of creation, which we just had before, such objects could be used as follows. So I read you now the description here in English again, um, how these objects were used. And if we wouldn't have that text, we wouldn't actually didn't know what the object was made for. One should take a strong vessel made of ore that should con be concave inside and provides a small opening on its top and la slightly larger one on its belly. <coughs> the vessel should have legs so the body doesn't touch the ground. It is filled with water and both openings tightly closed with wood. One places one places it upon a strong fire. I always wonder how the wood then kind of doesn't get burnt. So that steam is generated inside whose power breaks one of the both op or bo one or both closed openings. If at the top, the water flows widely dispersed into the fire. If breaking at the bottom, the water splashes into the fire and with the steam's power shoots fire and hot ash far away from the fire in the surrounding area. Such a vessel therefore is called a blower and shaped after a man blowing. To elucidate the presence of the four elements in Albertus Great's description, I have highlighted the, four, the, the terms for the four elements in the Latin text. So I have made, adjusted my uh, translation a little bit and now you see kind of the terms which we can directly relate to the four elements, um, which I don't read now. In Latin, just point out the term terram, aqua, igne, fire, vapor, um, aqua, igne, vaporis, igne. You see kind of that we have them all present. So, so even the suflantis, so the, at the end of the text, the letter is the phrase used in the Genesis account for the animation of Adam, which is also, I think, relevant. So to conclude, I would like to revisit and consider the types of object I have discussed thus far thus far. The four elements of the Engelberg cross, the 12 stone tracts and the stones on the cross, the diagrams and manuscript illuminating tracts by Cassidor, Isidore, Rabanus, and Honorius, the four elements in illumination of Genesis, and the blower in action. All those, all those five constitute, relate, and situate the beholder within the complex weave of relationship between homo, mundus, cosmos, and annus or tempus. The qualities attributed to the nature of the single elements and the intersecting attributes forming relationships among them made them invisible, made the invisible visible, allow the beholder to grasp, perceive, and understand what holds everything together, and in other words, the viewer's insight constitutes the cosmos and connects it visible with the invisible elements. Like the reverse and the fun part of the cross with which we started, the connections between the two sides, the connections between the two sides and its elements can only be understood together. They are not two sides of a coin, but seeing them together constitutes the world for the beholder and her himself, giving him her his place. Balancing the body and healing imbalances, evil or sin, or temptations the devil might have caused. Thank you. Thank you, Beate, for this fascinating trip. Uh, I'm <laughs> I have a few questions, but I love uh, to which extent pre-modern women and men are close to us. This 
spectacular trip into diagrams going deeper and deeper this is guys research today scholarship is exactly this right <laughs> no really this is so terribly speculative and this impressive idea trying to put all together right in one diagram everything we know from 1000 years this is quite spectacular so thank you so much um i think we can immediately open the debate if there are any question observation so on I, I have few of them so if i do not see immediately any hands oh there is theodora she's preceding me always please mm -hmm. uh, i wanted to ask uh, whether we have other examples of uh, combination of precious stones the 12 stones and elements in uh, uh, art objects from the 12th century or other centuries my next step to do. I mean, we, I, I, we would need an object that still has 12th century stones. Mm. And then the question is, how far can we go? I found it particularly intriguing that in the cross, what struck me first and brought me to the idea to think about the four, the four, the four elements was the fact that it was always four different stones. And so I want, I, the next step, what I would do now is I would like to go to similar crooks, and we don't have that many crooks schemata from the 12th century. Most of them we have are actually older, kind of, and then it's a slightly different story, but I would like to have other 12th century crosses that give particular evidence to 12, to the four colors, and order them in specific way. And I haven't found a cross that was matching that kind of, like usually you have like the red ones are in the corner and then you have white ones in between and then you have a blue or a, a green one. You have a system, but you don't have that, the display of four different colors. And that is what I found intriguing, but um, this is an ongoing project and although this might now have killed yourself by all the different aspects I have brought up, but. Um, I'm still in the middle of thinking what should I do and what should I make out of it? Like in, if I, why turn it into a bigger article, that would be exactly the, the type of other objects I would still like to pull in. What I wanted to do for the lectures, I wanted to show you how systematically between different categories of objects, we actually have this interest for the four elements that it's not just kind of limited to philosophers who read Aristotle and try to make some sense of, out of it, but we can see it in all types of even liturgical objects. And that was what mattered to me today. But if I now continue the research for, for that project and go further, that is exactly the next step. But I haven't found really the good crosses that match to, otherwise I have, would have had some backslides, but I don't have them yet. So I still need to do that part of work more systematically. Thank you very much. If you know one. So, uh, Ruben. Okay. Thank you for this very fascinating presentation. And I was struck especially by the last object, the, the blower, because I didn't see anything like it. <laughs> and. Uh, it's so interesting and uh, uh, I was wondering um, what is the main function of this object because I understood the connection with the elements but I missed the main function of this object and I was also wondering how many of these objects are preserved. No. Itai Weinrib makes a longer discussion and he has I think two references, written references to other objects which are not preserved so if you look into his book, Itai Weinrib. The one on the bronze object. Yeah, the bronze object. There he has the most extensive discussion on, on, on the most recent one, and you find more literature on that. But this one is quite unique, and as you might have noted, I I'm, I'm have sheeted a little bit. This is not really matching. I, this figure is not really constructed in the way that this opening is system. It looks like something has happened to that sculpture and not that something was actually designed as a nice clear opening. So although we have this nice text and that alignment. Down? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that that is what I think is that the lower where the lower kind of that looks like a belly button 
that this is the actual original opening that then later was closed and that something else that this hole which you see in the middle is actually the later kind of a later um, opening that was not intentional there. But it's really something kind of, we, we have that figure which is in Vienna and then we have not, it's not a large group of objects. And for you also ask for the purpose. Yes. So it definitely is teaching. So it's like this experimentum which we today know more from the scientific idea, like you do an experiment to prove something. But experimentum is also, in the medieval sense, really something you experience. And you experience things you can't actually see. And you can only understand by grasping the effects. And so this medieval, and I think, I forgot who was that. There's a really nice discussion of the notion, the medieval notion of the word ex experimentum. Um, that, and how it refers to our modern idea of a scientific, scientific experiment in the natural sciences. And I think that's important to keep that in mind. Liturgical object. I have two questions. One of them is this incredible uh, Swissocentric situation, right? Because the six, man six manuscripts in Bern, uh, the cross. Mm. I, 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 this is even not a question, just a surprising commemorating. Being myself a proud Swiss, obviously, I am even more impressed by this by the situation, but can you say, tell us something about the context? Because for me, it's really impressive. Six manuscripts in 90 years, right? So this is totally crazy. And uh, what does it mean? I mean, what is your idea about this? Those six manuscripts come originally from France because it's from the, it's fr the origin is from the famous donor who, were, who gave all the manuscripts to the Burger Bibliothek in France. So most of them come from Fleury or from other some. So it's not that these, tra so kind of, it's nice that they are now all in the Burger Bibliothek this and are right. present, but that is, you have to say, comes all from the same donation from someone who actually never was in Bern, but who was someone who died and left his heritage to a Bernese woman. And that's how all these fantastic manuscripts, the Bern Physiologus and all these Carolingian illuminated profane um, manuscripts, are actually ended up in, in Bern in the Burger Bibliothek. And part of that, um, that, that group of manuscripts and, and these, 12, these 12 texts are actually found in, in a part where, where the current curator of this part of the manuscript thinks it was like a box of like um, choirs that never were really bound. Mm. And so these are usually choirs that only contain like a couple of leaves. The texts themselves are mostly only three or four pages. And um, I have transcribed them all and went, went through them. And it's, it's really something you find. It, it tells us more about what, what was found in a scriptorium and what has inspired people who were writing these other texts. And it's like notebooks, like scribbles and stuff. And that, I think, is essential to keep in mind how goldsmiths work. Because in these, these box probably box where they were all kept together. We also found very important texts like the Decl Declarea tract, which is the tract on egg yolk and the use. So where we have specific so, um, information, how you prepare, how you use egg yolk in preparing the, the color for the making of manuscript. And so I think those kind of the box with these leftover choirs that never were part of really bound manuscript. That is what has been in the past years extensively studied by the curator and where really new unknown 11th century texts came out. Yeah. And so it's, it's a part of, uh, it also tells us a lot about how knowledge and manuscripts and loose choirs have actually kind of survived over the time and for us, it's a lucky coincidence because I think it's not, they don't have to be Swiss, but they have to, they show us how kind of a goldsmith, a manuscript illuminator, and a national philosopher were actually part of the same scholarly community and were interacting in the production of their new tracts 
in the production of liturgical objects and in the production of the illumination of the manuscripts. And because we art historians like to keep those things apart, I wanted to pull them together and show you today to, to also to lower your, your fears to sometimes t jump to another material to ex actually make your point and argue for like something like a, uh, a collective inspiring idea. So 12th century Switzerland definitely had also those tracks. So Engelberg actually had the Marbot of Rennes, which is one of them, mm -hmm. but it didn't have six. And the fact that um, the, the six different ones, that was really collected in the 15th, 16th century by this famous person um, who kind of went through all the French monasteries and, and tried to get those and collect them as a private human. It also sense with the places. Fleury as a place where you have this, you have all the production. Fleury is an important part of the origin, but we also have some others. But they were definitely French. No. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have other questions? Observations? <coughs> no. Okay. Further, what, you, what <laughs> would you like to know? Like I'm, I'm a little bit at the crossroad. Like in, in a way, I, I could go further into the cross direction, and then I would be more strongly on the liturgical objects. But I'm kind of, I'm unsure what I should do with the material because I think I have figured out why there are four elements on the Engelberg cross. But I think I need a little bit more to, to make it more coherent. I know what Martin was supposed to please Martin. <laughs> what do you suggest? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously it's the yeah. same. Mm -hmm. What I would think. Yeah. Yeah, please leave the mic. No, I need yeah, it's liturgical. I'm s and I I didn't want to pose the qu <laughs> and I didn't want to pose the question because it I think it's I, I don't know, like it's it's very complicated stuff of the ember days, for example, is the way ember days, it's the way it's the liturgy. Yeah, it's a liturgical kind of thing which separates the year into four kind of calendars. Yeah. So it, it was the, the stuff uh, which I th was thinking in, in, in regard to the liturgy. Uh, like, because you're speaking about the liturgical use of it, but I want, I, wa I want to ask, and I think it's very complicated to answer, what would be the precise kind of connection? And so this was the Ember Days would be one thing, perhaps, which I would be searching for. Yeah, it's system of four. Uh, well, well, that that's the the question of origins of those days. And but it's like, um, it's four, but it's um, linked to the kind of uh, very, perhaps to the pagan calendar before. So it's like, you know, the year which is kind of separated into these four sections, and then this idea is getting into the Christian kind of calendar. And then I, I was again thinking about the Genesis and the the, the story of creation, if perhaps the liturgical text or the liturgical manuscripts could also kind of hint at the idea of four elements because we've seen it in the images but is it also kind of integrated into the texts and so perhaps uh, y have you seen something like this or not? Specific liturgical text in mind that actually mentions the four elements in any of the liturgical descriptions in um, yeah. Yep. No, mm, I, I, no, I don't actually, mm -hmm. so I yeah. just... I haven't come across, but... I will try to figure that out. And what, is, what you write about is that the time of the Amos is the most neglected time. Yeah, the the part, I think there we could figure out something more, but I haven't... I have ni neither found a good text yet mm -hmm. that that talks about the year as with, with reference to some of the uh, or all of the four elements, and I would really love that. Yeah. But I have I, I haven't I haven't found that yet. Um, what about the Easter, uh, the Sunday of Easter, and uh, the ritual of the Sunday of Easter? Because uh, I mean, in the Roman uh, liturgy. Surely in Carolingian period, there is this evocation of the four elements during the let, if I'm not wrong. 
mentions earth, like maybe the tomb of Christ, um, the or the the cross, the location of the cross. We there is the blessing of the water, which is occurring. The fire, the, the, the fire night is, looks, is the looks moonbeam. Beginning of the sky. I mean, we we could figure out some of that, but I want to have a text that actually talks about it, the events unusually in the way that I can clearly see there's an emphasis of the four elements, and I haven't seen that. Mm. Well, now, we should look more intensively okay. too, yeah. Well, uh, I'll write, I'll, I'll agree with him. I, think <coughs> I, I would go back to the cross. I mean, I w I'm curious to see more about, you no, know, and also the, the performative aspect of this cross, which is uh, so both for intellectual and not, so the double pub, double audience, and obviously we have this sort of passion for the silver side and the gem side, which is an early medieval tradition now, or late antique tradition, now becoming something even more spectacularly intellectual. So this is, wow. I also want to go back to Engelberg and look into the literature Portugal sources there a little mm. bit closer and if there there is something which I haven't seen because some of those texts are not edited yet and not on equality so I haven't um, if this has been produced certainly in a big center I mean the quality is I mean you did not discuss it but this would be a matter of enormous discussion the incredible quality of the of the of the four elements I mean how they are done and the antique models which are there and also I mean the, the, the yeah, the, the Moses with the, the, the with the cross, and um, and the snake is just superb. Another part I would like to embed the discussion of the brazen serpent. I mean the healing and sp the the he healing and illumination at the same time. That is something I would like to do a little bit more, and I mean that is what struck me immediately that I think the the quality is just of of these four elements is just so and here that's something I haven't really discussed but you can really read that as a circle and that then explains actually the and here I go back to S. Meyer and um, her discussion of the divine quaternities and she argues that on based on a, a discussion of Gregor in the great act, exegesis of, the, of a passage from Ezekiel, she discusses that the four elements can be read exactly in that, like that you start with man and the water, then you have the death, the ascension, and the resurrection, and then you don't have kind of Easter, but you have really the year mm. in a way. And that is, I think, the most convincing part, and I would like to go to the Engelberg um, collection and see if they have the Gregory of Great text of this exegesis and then you can actually see that kind of you can see that circle as kind of also a representation of the liturgical year and that is a part I would like to expand a little bit further and as Maya um, has really done a profound um, uh, for, for, or reading her may it, it suddenly became clear and she discusses the four elements, she doesn't discuss the cross, but through her discussions of the four elements in that context, I, I clearly understood, or I understood why the order must actually be original and not uh, just kind of an unusual non-pairing that doesn't really match. So I think it's also interesting that the embedding the time aspect of a liturgical year overrules kind of the fire fire thing like that the john the ego mm. and and the air doesn't doesn't match and things like that 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 is something never together but still you know them and but it seems to be so relevant to have that kind of that um circle and that um reading it in that way that this is more important than than yeah, the and I, that was relevant to me because I thought, okay, you really read also the cross not only as part of an object from a liturgical, um, from the annual liturgy in the church, but you also see that as a representation of this liturgical annual cycle. 
already in my mind. I haven't. I have skipped because I thought you were you, you're gonna die if I go into <laughs> detail and do another Gregory of Great exegesis part into it. Is there someone who has other suggestions? No. If not, so I, I think we can once more express our gratitude. As usual, uh, we can conclude with advertisement for the next Sredovekinak, which will be in Czech. And this will be by Martin Drlicek on uh, the body of the pilgrim on the road, especially between the 12th and the 14th century. So everybody is welcome. And uh, as usual, I should say the three stuff I don't want to say. Firstly, that uh, you can obviously follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Is it so? Okay. Uh, the second thing is that um, you can still become member of the Association of the Friends for, of our center. Everybody, by the way. And uh, the last point, I forget it. So this must not be so important. So uh, please follow us. And yeah, yeah, I should do this and say subscribe, right? OK, <laughs> this is the last point I was supposed to say. Um, so <coughs> thank you for everybody for being there. And uh, we have the usual beer at the usual place, so everybody is welcome to share a beer with Beate, who then, as a true uh, global professor, will be running to take her train to Paris. But uh, before it, uh, she will share a beer with us, so everybody is more than welcome. Thank you. <laughs>